Warning, this podcast typically features spoilers and strong opinions. Proceed with caution. Hello there, and welcome to episode one of Then a Moment, uh, the podcast where an audiobook narrator and a childhood development expert talk about stories. Mm -hmm. My name is Pavi Prochko. I'm the audiobook narrator. And I'm Colin Funk. I am the childhood development expert. And today we're going to be talking about Fire Island. Fire Island, yeah. Mm -hmm. Movie on Hulu. Um, and we're going to have fun with that one. I really liked it. Um, yeah. But first, uh, Colin, any good moments this week? Yeah. Um, so many good moments. <laughs> Uh, Tell me more. <laughs> I think my favorite moment of the week, um, I got to ride the elevator down with two of my favorite babies today. I, huh? <laughs> for some backstory, I do teach music classes to babies, and sometimes the babies are great and want to hang out. And so as I was leaving, they wanted to ride the elevator with me, which was great. Oh, cute. <laughs> Pavi, what about you? What are your favorite moments from the week? Oh, or moment, um, if you uh, we're recording this on the 15th of February. Yeah. Uh, yesterday was Valentine's oh. Day. Uh, and uh, I got to uh, have uh, dinner with my husband and two of our favorite friends. Yes. 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 yes we did. If if um, if you don't know, um, I am said husband. <laughs> that Buried is, the lead. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was a that was the food wasn't great, but it no, was a but great it was, night. Uh, yes, the the moment was great. Yes, without the food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was mine. Lovely. Yeah. Should we talk about uh, a movie? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So Fire Island. Fire Island. What do we know about Fire Island? <laughs> I've never been to Fire Island. Have you been to Fire Island? I have not, no. So it's uh, from what I gather uh, from this film and from rumors. Uh, it is a, a resort. It's a, like a vacation resort where gays go in the summer mm -hmm. off of New York. Off of New York, yeah. Uh, some island off of New York. And they go and have vacations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, got a lot of history in gay culture it was a place where gay people could escape to when it was illegal to be gay and kind of have their own sort of mm -hmm. hideaway in right. a way yeah uh and today it's you know it's a uh, has mythic <laughs> uh right. yeah uh, there's a lot of like myths surrounding it there's a mm -hmm. lot of, it's like a, a magical place to go and uh it's very sexy and yeah. um which Obviously makes it the perfect setting for a Pride and Prejudice retelling. Yes, of course, of course. Because as we find out with uh, Fire Island watching it, it is just Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So Fire Island, the movie, is um, produced and starring Joel Kim Booster. Mm -hmm. um, and he apparently was vacationing on Fire Island and always reads Pride and Prejudice while he's there. and So weird. <laughs> <laughs> seems like a strange choice, yeah, but really weird. while uh, he was reading it, it clicked that, you know, this could be... Why, why not Pride and Prejudice here? Yeah, I th actually think that's really interesting. I, I have my Shine Bright uh, journal nice. uh, where I've sure. taken my notes about this. I'll open that up. <laughs> uh, forgive the, the bumpies. Um, boop, boop. Um, before we get into that, you know Joel Kim Booster personally. Yes, yes. I went to college. Um, we both went to Millican University for theater. Mm. <laughs> and, um, you know, haven't, you know, kept in touch because he, you know, became famous and sure. now is starring in movies. Yeah, I think a lot of that even comes through. Like there's some characters there that are, you know, washed up former actors or oh, musical yeah. theater majors in there. The... Uh, Luke and Keegan, and mm -hmm. I think they, he, those you, are people he knows yeah, for you, sure. You, you know? definitely see the 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 theater student influences for sure. 
Yeah, and what what gay theater student doesn't love <laughs> Jane Austen? You know, true, true. <laughs> um, but I thought it was actually it's a really good setting for kind of this like Edwardian English. Um, his story of propriety mm-hmm. uh, and kind of transferring that to gay culture in like 2022 weirdly works really well. Yeah. I thought about that. That That's the thing that really struck me like watching it is how well those, those parallels fit in a way that, you, you know, you watch a lot of movies that are like, Oh, they're retellings of this. And they're kind of like fitting a, a round peg in a square hole. And yeah. they're like, let's try to make this work as this. But like I think gay culture as this uh, allegory to like that the the sort of etiquette and social rules. Yeah, it's it's one of the areas of society today that like for being so um, anti-establishment in a lot of right. ways, and for being so like liberated, it's very restrictive. It has right. kind of those. Um, well, there's rules. There's... There are rules, yeah. That there, we, He even says, I wrote down a quote, we right. separate ourselves from each other into high class and low class, like from using like, you know, we've got, you know, no fats, no femmes, no Asians. We've, right, you know, right. How buff are you? We've got otters. We've got bears. We've got, you know, mm-hmm. all the different types of people um, that get separated out and some are in and some are out. Right. And, and the rules are kind of unspoken. Yeah. Some of them, some of them are, <laughs> I guess, are written down in the, in the app so oh, we can, sure, we can see them sure. written out, but yeah, but yeah, I think the movie was really interesting. They used like social class, they used, you know, income and wealth, but they also looked very specifically at, at that gay hierarchy. Mm-hmm. You know, we're looking at attractiveness level. We look at, um, race that was, you know, yeah. something that they bring up that becomes a, a, a theme. And I think those things, not only does it reflect well on the original story, but I, I think the original story is a, is a really cool setting to bring those things to the forefront. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things most fascinating about it is it's, it, even the original one is like the, mm-hmm. we have these people that are against the system as it is. Um, that also operate within the system and yes. benefit from it. Um, yeah. And, you know, you think about Elizabeth Bennett in the original, you know, <laughs> and she's like, she's like, why do I need a husband? You know, it's like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't need to do that thing. Right. Um, but really she kind of does. And she wants to one and two, like society means like a, she has to actually do that in order to function within the society. There's yeah. a great moment in this movie um, where the Bo and Yang character um, plays like somewhere between the Jane uh, character, the Jane Bennett and mm-hmm. Charlotte. And Charlotte, yeah. He's like a mixture of the two. Really good kind of duplicating characters on there. Yeah, that was um, uh, I guess I, I should have too. said spoiler alert. <laughs> like if you're listening or watching this podcast, you're going to. Uh, we're going to spoil yeah, everything. Yeah, gonna... the, presumably, you've you've watched this um, film, um, so uh, sorry if you haven't. Uh, our bad, um, but mm-hmm. that's a <laughs> in perpetuity spoiler alert. But anyway, the Bowen Yang character, he says Howie, he, right? Howie, yeah, yeah. He he looks to uh, Noah, the Joel Kim Booster character, and even says like, "Stop pretending like you don't know how the world works." Yes, is this great moment right there, um, where mm-hmm. it, where he is able to he just it's it's kind of the microcosm of like the whole story right there, where you have this person, this Noah, who they're kind of going to Fire Island, they're on the ferry. He takes off his shirt. He's like, "Well, it's time." He takes it off. Yeah. The friends are all like, "Oh my gosh!" You know, you're like laying into the the you know. The, the body image things the you know the these really high standards of body image all the rest of the people on the ferry take their shirts off he has his voiceover where he says you know I don't really even care about any sure, of that yeah. but it's like yeah sure you, but you do but yeah. you do I mean that's the whole that's his whole arc and the whole story is like you know he's saying things like oh I don't use 
sex to to feel better. I feel better, so I get more sex. And it, it I don't know, it doesn't quite ring true because right. I think there is a little bit of a give and take. And I think he kind of downplays and to your point, when he has the confrontation with how his character, we see that it's not just um, it's not just him transcending this lifestyle. It's him, you know, having found his place in the lifestyle and feeling happy with that, and that n- allows him to be able to kind of pull himself out and look from the outside. Yeah. And I don't think he even in the you know film gives himself enough credit for that. Like sure. he he keeps saying like no 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 I'm not part of it I don't like, um, but to get to that place I think he it, it it really seems like he had to find his place in that yeah, society. It's accept it. It's that freedom from acceptance. Right. Yeah. You know, or, or just like as. And you accept and then you're free, right? Freedom by way of. Right. Yeah. You know, how his character was saying, like, you know, it's great for you that, you know, you were able to get attractive and and find your your place and feel accepted into the community. Um, and I don't think, you know, the Noah character sees that, sees that that's part of why he has this kind of superpower to to, yeah. to live outside of it. Yeah, to protect himself, inoculate himself from that vulnerability. Right. That they talk about that a lot too. Where it's yeah. how you're protecting yourself. And he even tells how you gotta protect yourself. Don't be so vulnerable. And in the end, how he's like, but I want to. I want right. that actually. Um very sweet moment. And I think that's true of a lot of people. It's it just rings really true even from people that I know and kind of mm-hmm. how the people talk about these things um, on Twitter, or, you know, awful places like that. Um, <laughs> and just like just the, the general conversation in culture about like how these things are supposed to go. You're supposed to like be liberated and free and screw monogamy. And right, right. And we're we're supposed to be able to do it. All these things that we want. Um but like sometimes people don't want that. Sometimes they're just like, yeah, I know. It's just like what everybody else is doing. And it was, this is how my grandparents did it. And I kind of like that. I want that. I want this. Yeah. I think that, I think that moment with Howie is, is really powerful when he is voicing his desire to get to be vulnerable, to get to yeah. make a connection. And I think that's very human. And, and we're seeing like, Noah's character who keeps saying, you know, you have to protect yourself. And to me, it sounds like you need to have walls up. You know, right. it doesn't, you, you're not really making that connection. Uh, so I think that um, conversation between Howie and Noah is really powerful. And I also, th- when watching it, I, I was thinking that the end moment between Will and Noah uh-huh. kind of is confusing. It makes that yeah. confusing a little bit to uh, me. Uh, remind me what happens at the end there. So at the end, they, you know, like w- what would have been the, you know, Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy. Oh, that's like the, <laughs> that's like my favorite thing from, I mean, we'll talk about it in another episode, but the Pride and Prejudice, the 2005 Pride and Prejudice movie is Excellent. one of my absolute favorite movies. Yes. The soundtrack is unreal. And we should talk about the soundtrack for this too. It's interesting. Um, but sure that scene at the end where it's, uh, you know, um, well, shall I call you Mrs. Darling when I'm cross with you? And she says, no, only when you're incandescently happy and it just ends with those s- strings coming. Oh my God, I love it. And so I'm like, I, I was hoping for something as powerful. Yeah, and I think something, the, the thing that makes that work is is she finally gives into this like romanticism that she's yeah. been avoiding the whole time. Right. And it kind of... I think what they're trying to do in Fire Island is still stick with that idea that you're talking about, that like gay people, we don't have to fit into monogamy. We don't have to fit into the rules of society. So they're trying to set it up. So it's not like this isn't this big romantic moment. They haven't like fallen in love yet. They're not like devoting their lives together uh, to each other at this point. But they, what happens is, you know, 
they're like, what's going to happen? And Will's like, well, I don't really want to be monogamous. And Noah's like, all right, so then what? What are we yeah. doing? He's like, why can't we just dance? Let's just dance. dance. Yeah. It just the the reason I think it works so well in Pride and Prejudice is because it is that total giving over. Yeah. It's the total acceptance and the total I've actually given up and now I have a partner. It's the absoluteness and the grandness of that gesture that makes right. it so powerful. Where if you're like, actually, I'm not, I'm not into monogamy and I don't like dogs. And really, I just want to dance like that, those old, those old fogies over there. Yeah. Uh, it cheapens it a little bit. It's just kind of like, oh, like, let's, like I think let's I, I get what flat. they're doing. Yeah. But I, I think I would want I, w I want that kind of like moment of surrender they don't have yeah. to make it like this big you know romantic like oh we're gonna we're now in love and we're spending the rest of our lives together even if it's just a moment where will is like you know let's not worry about that let's right. just totally just give in to now give in to now it yeah. just now yeah and that would have been more powerful. I think they actually do it better with uh, when Charlie comes to save or to stop Howie. Oh, uh, sure. And he's like, I love you. <laughs> like declares oh that gosh, he's in love. And moment. they're like, oh, whoa, there's actually really way too much. Um, that is We're funny. not there yet. And I think it's very funny. Yeah. And it like pokes fun at that kind of the rom-com thing where it's like, yeah, we've known each other for five days and no, you don't love me. And I right. don't love you. And even if you did, you should probably keep that to yourself because it's weird. But they, I think they do that better where the potential for – that could absolutely be forever. It could. Yeah. And I want to see that could. If you're not going to give us the forever Mrs. Darcy, Mrs. Darcy, Mrs. Darcy moment mm -hmm. where they're going to live happily ever after, married at the huge mansion, I need to know that it's possible. And they just told us it wasn't. Yeah, and maybe, maybe they were trying to like hint at it by being like, what do you want? And he points to this, to old, this couple. old couple. And, yeah. you know, I think it's supposed to evoke this imagery. Like, sure. oh, they have they might last that yeah, long right, to be sure. the old people that are still dancing together. Right. Which is like, that is something, you know, as a gay person, it's especially post-AIDS pandemic to see, like, older gay men couples that are still together is kind of, it's still pretty rare. Yeah. It feels rare. It feels special. It feels yeah. powerful to me. Yeah. Um, but I think th maybe that kind of imagery is, is they're, they're, they're kind of leaning on that to do the work right in that moment. Yeah. Instead of, I mean, they could have even been more direct about it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, so I had mentioned uh, earmarked the soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was, I think it struck me, this is the second time I've watched it, refreshing our memory for this episode. Um, I liked the way they went back and forth between kind of more modern stuff. And then every, there was often yeah. classical things to kind of evoke that Jane Austen era to make it feel like we're in, this Edwardian romance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I really appreciated that. Yeah. Um, and even, even some of the contemporary stuff, I noted that like they didn't, they had a few, like at the beginning they had um, the Willy Wonka song, but not yes, the, 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 the sampled. It, it was really interesting. So it's like, they're not even like using they're 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 they played with references a few times throughout the, the mm -hmm. movie where they, you know, I think through music, through references and through some of the camp, I think they were really um, kind of leaning into a very specific style. Yeah. Um, which I thought worked very well. Yeah, it's very nerdy. It's very clear that Joel Kimbooster is a yes. little bit of a nerd. Oh, yeah, for You've sure. You've got Margaret Cho, first of all. Margaret Cho. Hello, Margaret Cho. Amazing. Love it. I love Margaret Cho. Um, but... Her, <laughs> she's like getting ready for stuff. Just fly, you fool. Like, yeah, another like we've got some Gandalf uh -huh. in there. Yeah. I think that's so funny. 
Um, uh, there was, oh gosh, there was another thing, the weird letter from a Victorian ghost line. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Oh, you legally blonded him. Yes. Um, uh -huh. That's where he's talking about the uh, using, like, you know, I exaggerated the laws a little bit to get, you know, Dex to, to take down his, his porny video. Uh, speaking of, we have to do legally blonde at some point for one of these episodes. Yeah, well done. Um, <laughs> Duh. Uh, I I just it, the style is really interesting and it 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 lends to a lot of the jokes that were happening. Like there's some very right. interesting kind of they're almost slapstick. They're almost cartoony. Um, something you would maybe see in like Family Guy or American Dad or maybe Matt Groening more more likely. But um, sure. one of the ones that I wrote down is Whitty's like they're going to the party. Um, at the, the house that Charlie's staying at, <laughs> they, like have this bottle of wine and like, oh no, oh, we can't bring that. And they just oh throw yes, it. and then <laughs> and we hear in the distance. Yeah, you just hear, ah, oh my god. <laughs> I think that's so funny, <laughs> so stupid, but it really like played into that style very quickly. That was like right at the top. Really. Yeah, I mean, and it kind of goes goes with what we were saying about like it being using gay culture meshed with Pride and Prejudice, I think really lends itself to something, like we expect something stylized, we, like, yeah. and, and using, you know, the, the tradition of using camp in, in gay film. Mm -hmm. I think it's really smart way to bring, you know, gay culture style to, you know, represent this very stylized piece. Yeah. Because Jane Austen, this it's is a, very it's a style. particular style, yeah, absolutely. Style. And even the, you know, imagining that the way she wrote it is how they lived. It just was, it was all a style. Like it's sure that, that, uh, the way um, that they carry each other and the the things that are important to them. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got. I I remember reading it the first time and like when Lydia goes with Wickham. I'm not feeling like that was such a big deal, mm -hmm. and like of course at the time. It would be a huge deal that someone comes and like, you know, some young girl right. is like taken away and, you know, going to basically, you know, ruin the family name unless you give a lot of money or I'm not going to marry her and she's right. going to be, you know, a, a spinster forever. I've sullied her. And like where that, it kind of doesn't really happen like that anymore, except he found this really great analog. Uh for this, where it's like the OnlyFans and the the their friend Luke's face is like getting in, posted without the getting permission. Getting posted without the it's, permission, and it was like that is a really smart analog for that. I I mean I think this movie is filled with smart analogs. Yeah, like yeah. I, that that moment particularly that whole relationship, the way that that works, the I think the family dynamic. I mm -hmm. think that's brilliant. I think using. Um, that the gay I idea of like a found family yes, as like the down. family yeah. base is yeah. so smart. It's such a good idea. Yeah. There's a lot of that language that we hear about like your chosen family, chosen family. He's got this yes. makeshift family and they fill those roles and they're all a little bit much. And, and um, I think that's so smart. It was so smart. It's so smart. And I it gives that the same sense of urgency where it's like these yeah. are the only people they have is each other. This is the only haven they have is this house. And it really builds those stakes right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, uh, bringing in my <laughs> the storytelling expertise, but I, it just, it, it stacks the problems really well at the top. And part of it is like, it's cheating a little bit. It's like the <laughs> Pride and Prejudice is already very good at this. Yeah. And he's just kind of like, I'm going to do that too, and I'm just going to make it gay. Um, but you could still screw that up pretty yeah, easily. Yeah, I mean, you but, see it all the time. Like the setup is so good, you know. Uh, they don't um, – I'm not going to uh, look at a guy until you get laid, he says, you know. And so we're already, like, from the get-go, we've got this conflict. Uh, he's a, They're about to lose the house. He doesn't have a phone. The they phone. don't have any money. <laughs> they're, oh. you know, they're the just all of the – 
the trappings of society, you know, even the, all the stuff on the ferry where it's like, here's, we're all broke people who, you know, we're all working brunch forever and now we're still broke, but yeah. we still somehow find enough money to go here and hang out at Margaret Cho's house. Um, and now it's the last summer that they're going to be able to do. It just like really built so much of the tension there yeah. that even these kind of like, this is small stuff. The OnlyFans thing is a little bit of a big deal um, as far as, like, sure. legality, and it's awkward. But, like, there, it's it's possible if they if it wasn't the last summer, for example, if it wasn't all of these other things were stacked on, the fact that they had kind of, like, on and off weird romance things that didn't work out or were a little bit stressful would have been whatever. You know, it's like, well, sure. I'll try again next year or I'll be on Grinder next weekend back in New York. It'll be fine. Right. But it just made everything so this is the last time we have to make it mean something. And it just, yeah. it even as an audience member watching it, I'm like, yeah, it's important. It's really important. Uh, really making those stakes high. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, very similarly to Pride and Prejudice itself. It's a small, it's a family story. Yeah. It's about yeah. the relationships, right. especially between the family. Right. And the stakes are low in the scheme of earth, <laughs> but right. really high for these people. Right. And that's what's important. That's actually what we're looking for. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think they do a really good job of preserving those stakes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it tracks so well with Pride and Prejudice. I, I, um, I think we'll talk about our, our favorite moments in a minute. Uh, uh, but I, I was just thinking about like the, the first moment that I, realize that it was Pride and Prejudice because I didn't know. Yeah, you didn't know. The first <laughs> I had time. no idea. I, I think other people did. <laughs> I didn't know, but I was like, <gasps> it's Pride and Prejudice. And it was like when they're in the rain arguing after like- It uh, took you that long? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that I'm like, oh my God, it is just Pride and Prejudice. I think I probably had like a little okay, hint, but sure. that's like the first moment where I'm like, oh, it's just Pride and Prejudice. And it's so good. Well, I love that. That's, I don't know if that- that moment to me, I felt was it. It is just Pride and Prejudice. It feels a little bit unearned in context to me. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about yeah. that in a minute. But. Yeah, we could talk about that. Sure. Um, that's actually a pretty good super. I'm going to write that down. Unearned moment. So, <laughs> should we um, talk about our favorite moments here? Sure. We're going to go into little superlatives here, little like uh, segments here. Let's do it. Um, so. Uh, just to keep it simple for now, uh, let's talk about our our favorite moment from the movie. You go first. <laughs> okay, I think my favorite moment. Oh, and I'm gonna forget the character's name. Um, the the friend who was reading at the beginning, Max. Max. Yeah, to the the Mary analog. <laughs> yes, the Mary analog, which I think is brilliant to have a yeah. Mary analog. There's a moment that. He decides to take drugs, <laughs> oh. and like the he, everyone's like, he's like, he's like, don't pressure me into taking drugs, and everyone's like, we weren't going to because you don't do that, and without telling anyone, he just shows up at the party and he's like, what's going on? And they're like, what's wrong? And they're like, oh my gosh, you did take drugs, <laughs> yeah. and they're like, okay, you're gonna be okay, and. Because he was accused of not being fun, that was part of it. Yeah. But he, like, looks at the Noah character and is like, "I am fun, and I am worth it." Yeah. And there was something s very sweet about that, and it was like it really, it brought me to Pride and Prejudice, but it like really, it like, I, I felt like it, it gave me so much of what everyone else was like feeling in the moment. Yeah. And he was like, that's, that's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And this is all my feelings right now. And everyone around is like kind of chaotic and crazy and kind of dealing with a lot of those things. Right. And it's like this perfect little like moment of human vulnerability that we get to see from this like side character. Yeah. And I think it, you know, just like Pride and Prejudice in the way it kind of like folds those little side stories in and weaves them in in a way that, that you know, 
don't just build the world, but like really round everything and everyone out. I think it was just really nice. Yeah, it's really artfully fulfilling that character arc for this character that you yeah. think could just be throwaway. Right. And it not only does it fulfill that individual character's arc where we actually get to see this little story happen for Max, mm-hmm. but we also get to use Max as that mirror for everybody else. Yeah. Everybody's actually stressing out about this thing. And and a foil to Noah in the yeah. moment yeah. to be like, you know, this is like to be that vulnerable and that honest about his feelings in that moment. Right. Yeah. So, so good. I think it's lovely. I think <laughs> it's great. Really great. That's my favorite. That's a good moment. I like that. What's your, what's, um, what's the best moment for you? I think my favorite moment, it's so stupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just love when Will is eating the little tiny ice cream cone. Oh my God. And Noah mentions it. It's like, I didn't take you for a, I didn't take you for a teeny tiny little ice cream cone kind of guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he just throws it. He doesn't just even look. He just, like, just like throws it. It was melting. And they bring it back later. Oh, they? And they do bring it back where he's like comes by and he's like eating the ice cream, sees him, throws it down and runs. I think that's so funny. And it really brings out kind of what I love about the Mr. Darcy archetype. Mm. It's just such a, there's something so lovable about Darcy. And I, I, I haven't quite put my finger on exactly why it is that way. Um, because he can be such a dick, you know, at the beginning. Like, they're yeah. he's kind of rude and a little bit like, but there's something you can see how reserved and that it's like they're just kind of awkward and like he can't really handle what's going on because he's right. just a little bit, it's a little too much and he's like out of his element. And Well, I mean, to your uh, to, you know, to your point, um, like you are seeing, you're seeing the flaw, you're seeing the charm, you're seeing the real human behind in these moments yeah. where you're like, oh, you see the embarrassment, you see, you see the cracks. They've, they've, they've made a person that isn't just, because if you're just seeing him rude and crazy, there's yeah. something like childish about it. Yeah. You're see, you're seeing that he's like doing things that are protecting him. That yeah. you're, you're, you're watching him. I don't know. It's like being playful, but not by choice. Like he just like, <laughs> you know, like even though he's like protecting himself, there is something playful about the way he holds himself. Yeah. There's actually a little bit of that vulnerability that yes. he also doesn't want to show. Yeah. But it is coming out weirdly. Yeah. Um, it's like, I don't want to get too much in the weeds of the Pride and Prejudice movie, but there's like a scene that it, uh, the first moment that really you're like, oh, Mr. Darcy's like into Elizabeth is like he helps her onto the carriage and she notices that they're holding hands. And then as he turns around and leaves, he like flexes his hand. Right, it's like yes. such a good camera shot. Um, but it's like, it's those moments where I was like, oh, there's something going on here. And you get to see kind of the, it's bubbling underneath. And the Will, the actor who plays Will, whose name I don't remember, I should look that up. Um, but he, uh, it's Conrad, Conrad Ricamora. Sorry if I butchered that. <laughs> um, but he's so good at having that, like the smoldering underneath where there's like the bubbling underneath this kind of really stoic facade. Um, mm-hmm. and it, mm-hmm. it just, it lends kind of these, these bursts of energy for those little moments of like throwing, throwing the, the ice cream where it's just like, I'm stoic, stoic, stoic ice cream. And it's just like those little, it's like little, um, little eruptions that just kind of come out just like out of the cracks, just like, oop. It's a little crack. Oh, it's a little crack. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it, it, I think he really does a great job. Yeah. yeah. I would say there's something with that character that is, I don't know. We could talk about it if we switch to worst moment. Oh, all right. Let's switch to worst moment. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm going to say worst moment only in that it's, like I said, I don't like it. It feels unearned in that 
they're expecting us to know both this Darcy Elizabeth relationship as well as how gay people behave. And then there's this, the, the moment is that the moment in the rain that you were mm. talking about, they have this confrontation and Noah's accusing him of things that I feel uh, that I'm like, what are you, I'm not sure you're getting this where he's like, you, you act like you're better than everyone else. I'm like, when, where, like, what are those moments that that happened? Um, and this, uh, the idea, he brought up the idea of like, oh, you, you don't like that you're gay and you're like, mm, you're yeah. mad about being gay. And I'm like, y- y- it feels a little bit out of, out of getting, the, yeah. I know why you want to do that. I know why you want that to be part of it and why that's what you're reading into things. I just like wish those moments were more clear. Yeah, I guess. And maybe, maybe you're right. That just like require that kind of pre-knowledge about those things because I, it tracks yes. for me where I'm like, oh yeah. It totally he, makes he, sense. The story that he knows is about the OnlyFans is that he doesn't like that I have an OnlyFans, Dex tells him. So it's like the extrapolation is like, well, he's just a self-hating gay and he's obviously been a, a jerk to us because he said this jerky thing while I was hiding in the bathroom. Yeah. And, and so now all of that, it's like, well, you think you're better. Your friends suck. I've lumped you in with your friends um, and you hate yeah. sex and you're just a self-hating gay and that's all it is. There's something... That happens in, like, I just feel like it, it, I buy it in Pride and Prejudice Yeah. for so long. It just, like, it is very, there's, there's a lot of, like, well, that couldn't be anything else, but it is. And yeah, I don't know what it is. And maybe it's, like, because of those little quirky cracks that you're talking about that maybe they're a little too campy mm. in, in this, depending on your... <laughs> only in context to this. I like right. how campy they are. I like yeah. what you were you were saying. I like that they humanized him yeah. and um added to that the likability and the all those things. But I, I they almost like undercut like those moments maybe if 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 the Noah character was was even more direct about saying things like Oh, because that happened, he is like this, and I think that does happen in the yeah the movie. I think maybe it even would have tracked better too if it had been just a, that moment would have tracked it even closer to Pride and Prejudice, where what if like Will comes and actually says like, "I want to go on a date with you," instead of it being like this weird argument and then kissing, and it's like, "What are you doing? You hate me." It just instead of it being like this weird, like let it be a little bit colder, friendlier, and then we'll be like, well, I I want to see you more, and then have Noah be like, what? That's weird. Why? Yeah. I don't really like you, and you don't really like me, and well, and I think something about well, I guess like, I mean, I'm thinking about it now. I, I think. It's funny, that moment I thought played really well because I think this like idea in the gay community, like you're not really interested in me, you're lusting after me, you're yeah. you're horny for me right now. Right. He even has I even like the the moment where like they have that weird argument about the book. The book, He's yeah. It's like somehow I'm both angry and horny right now. <laughs> and I think that's hilarious. And I think like that is a really interesting parallel to this, like, well, he's not really interested in me. He just thinks that I might be a good match. Like right. this like society thing, this, yeah. you know, I think that's, that's an interesting play. I just think there's something, I don't know. Yeah, And it might even be attached to the, in Pride and Prejudice, it's Darcy who actually is the cause for Bingley to leave Jane. That's true. That is true. And in this case, it's not. Yeah, that's... Will's not involved. And that would be the... That might be why it's kind of like disconnected because that right. would be why Noah would be angry. Be like, you ruined that. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I hate you. I can make up all this stuff about it, but it's really just about this thing that you ruined Howie's thing. And that could have been the better right. angle. It's like, no, I'm not going to kiss you. You ruined this thing. Why would you think that I would ever want to be with you? You ruined this 
potential match for my friend on his last Fire Island. Yeah. Screw you. I think if I think you're right that it leaves out something that is like a very direct this is like this is what he did and this is what I can't forgive. Right. Right. And it was just a little too unrelated. Yeah. It was not related. I don't, I don't know. The, the only way it was related was when Will is like talking about like well, uh, anything I said or did was to help Charlie. Yeah, I was just yeah, thinking yeah. about Charlie, but he never actually was the one that was like, come on, Reese, come back here. It was all Cooper. Cooper's the one that like did all of it. Um, the, the, the Reese stuff. Catherine, was... Catherine Bingley yes. slash. Which I Judy, loved. I, Judy I, I Dench loved character. that. Uh, I that loved mesh. Cooper being. Yeah. Cooper. I liked that. Yeah. Vile, vile human. Yes. Um, cool. What was your Good. my we can, we can my least skip favorite. to yours? <laughs> yes, my my worst moment. Oh. Um, I think. Oh shoot! I just dropped my pen. Um, I think my I I don't like the. It's a little falls flat right at the end. I think um, what we talked about with will saying that he's like well, i'm actually not into monogamy it seems a little convenient where it's like no it's like well i'm not really this thing and he's like will's like yeah me neither it's a little too perfect it's like we can be non-monogamous together but i don't know it, even the way just, they set it up though they did it the opposite of that they were like he's like i'm not monogamous and then noah's like a couple sentences later was like well i'm not really looking for anything serious so i'm like well then why aren't then you why are, yeah why aren't you happy like why isn't that like a oh Oh, then maybe, maybe that's can perfect. Work. Right. Like there, there's no, there's no, there's not that like total release. There's still so much like skepticism yeah. in the end. Yeah. yeah. And not that it has to be that same. Like they clearly made a different choice with the ending. Right. Right. It right. is not Pride and it Prejudice. It is not Pride and Prejudice. And, you know, hey, it's just our opinion, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think... That's my my least favorite, um, and we've talked about the unearned. You thought it was unearned that yeah. the moment. Um, any other moments of note? Any like uh, um, honorable mentions that you've got? I have a few that I've written down that I just then you go Tell mostly were thinking. very funny. I thought uh, I talked about the fly, you fools. I talked about um, yeah. uh, the bottle getting thrown out. Really great yeah. moment, I think, too. Yeah, there's that that bottle where he's like being the jerk to Noah, and Noah's like, "Yeah, the tap water's good here, and you don't have to like add to garbage." And it's like, "Oh," and he throws he away throws the bottle away, the bottle away, and then when Noah's gone, he like takes it out and puts it in the recycling. Which you know, whatever you think of recycling and whether it's actually effective, it's like this really interesting like character yeah. moment that we get to see him kind of flex against Noah. That Will is now, uh, you know, we actually get to see a little bit of. Well, like um, the goodness in him a little bit. And it's a nice little moment. Um, the, uh, I mean, I mentioned the, um, the how can I be angry and horny yes, moment. I thought that moment. was really I wrote that down. I was like, that is probably in this movie that has lots of kind of explicit kind of sex in it. Mm -hmm. Like it's not porn per se, but there's like, there's like pretty, sexual oh, situations no. in it. Yeah, and I'm, um that's actually the hottest moment, I think. That's like that moment. Sure. is really like the most I'm like, "Oh my goodness, gracious, what is happening here?" You get to really see that like that chemistry yeah. between them when they're arguing about this book, and it's like, "Well, if if it's up to debate, then why can't you just let me win?" Okay. You win. I mean, oh my God! <laughs> it goes to show, like, sexuality is not about the physical act. It's not yeah. about because there are scenes that is just like n lots of naked people having sex. Like, yeah. the, and I think the movie does a really good job of not shying away from yes the you know that's a that's a big part of what Fire Island at least the the fantasy is yeah. and what the the culture is they're 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 showing it they're yeah. showing these back rooms that people are having sex but they do it in a way that doesn't feel it's not super graphic no, it's, it's not 
Right. It's not like, but it's also not like artsy and like behind <laughs> of call me, curtain. Call me by your name. Uh, they pan away every yeah, time. Yeah, they pan away every single time. Oh that, my God. Like they're getting close Ugh. to anything. And then they show the Terrible. whole heterosex scene, the whole thing. Know, they show I the know. whole thing. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Yeah, I do appreciate that, that they really, it doesn't, it feels but they don't feel is not necessarily the right word, but it's like, it's not too much. And it doesn't feel like to your point, it doesn't feel like those are the moments that are, that are sexy. Right. The, the sexy moments are the moments that are relational, that are between two people that have a connection. Yeah. And those are those charged moments. Yes. And that is what I would say makes a sexy moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Uh, I had Margaret Cho. Um, oh, was that awful guy brought that letter? Another like very classic Pride and Prejudice moment where he brings he sends a letter, which is so it's so funny that they do that, and it's because he doesn't have a phone. He doesn't have a, he phone. Doesn't have a phone, so he gets a letter. It's so clever. An old phone that 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 dies when dies you throw it in the water. Water, but then he throws it. But then they reference it later. Yes. Oh my gosh, it's so smart it's because so he throws smart. the other phone in the water. And it is waterproof. And they're like, those don't. Those don't break anymore, you know. He's like, let me have this. <laughs> yeah. Very funny. Those are, I think. I just, it's really very clever. So very good. Uh, but the Margaret is like, what's his name? Woo. Woom. Oh my God. <laughs> <That's> so stupid. <laughs> so stupid. Margaret, like, did you improvise that? I hope so. Um, uh, oh my God. Where's Luke? We were making a podcast together. Uh, Keegan's uh, complaint. That's so funny. Um, and then very sweet moment with. Margaret Cho talking about like, you know, you know about all of just the fun things in my life and yes, um, and you don't know about the times that I really fucked up and and that I'm doing all of these, uh, you know, I I did all this terrible stuff and or didn't work and now I have no friends and all I have is you guys, um, and yeah. you know Howie doesn't need your help he's gonna be just fine, and then he jumps yeah. into the pool, <laughs> and, she and she immediately flips. Immediately <laughs> It's like, oh my God, my baby's drowning. So funny. Oh, it's good. There's like, it's it's good. like that that tension release is like so yes. nice. Great. Very um, good. It's just an excellent writer. It's just, it's a really good script. It's, I think it was very well done. Yeah. It's really great. And then Peppermint, Drag Queen. Oh yeah. One of Rue's, Rue's Queens in there. It's great. I did think that I was confused a little bit about... The whole scene. It's a little strange. It's like, I, it's one of those moments. I feel like one of the fun things about this film, we talked about a lot, obviously, but that you can watch it as a Pride and Prejudice fan and be like, ooh, what's this? Ooh, who's that character? Yeah. And Peppermint's the the sister, the... Peppermint, yeah, a little bit, is is uh, Georgiana. Yeah, because she's the one that brings that, that like brings them that together, lets yes. them have fun together. Yeah, and it and that whole scene is a little bit. It's statues of Pemberley, right? Yeah. It's like it's all that. Um, uh, where they're like walking, she's walking through the big Pemberley Manor, uh, thinking that he's away. Um, it's also just a little strange that uh, I seem to remember that in maybe I'm mixing up the timeline here chronology but there's like a lot of stress happening in the film where they're like looking for people and people mm -hmm. are missing and then suddenly he and will are just hanging out at the beach yes. reading uh -huh. books I, I wrote that <laughs> and i'm I like just wrote, then beach question I was mark? like why are you just you're like we're gonna take a break from searching for my friend who is somewhere because they he got the letter yeah and then he confronts him about it and then will was like i have the, this is really important i have to show you his instagram and then nothing about the instagram yeah, is it's not anything. important, really. Yeah, it's a little cryptic. Like, you should have just said he films people and puts them on his OnlyFans without permission. If that's what he means. If that's what he means, I, why didn't you just say that? The, it's unclear. That yeah. that was kind of like the, the moment I'm like, are you... Is that him like badly hinting at it? Like, are you afraid right. to say it? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a, it was, it's a little strange. Um. But it's nice to see Peppermint get in work. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I like Peppermint. Uh, that is a weird part of the movie, just to like give them some relationship, and it just doesn't kind of like fit right in there. Um, but there's another really great moment when Charlie comes um, with – Charlie and Will come. They're like, oh, my God, are we too late? Howie's left. Are we too late? What's going on? What do I do? And then they like interrupt the conversation – and Noah just looks at Howie and says, hey. Oh, yeah. And uh, Or looks at uh, Will and says, hey. And then Will looks at Noah and says, hi. 
at the just like it's like right in the middle. It was just it's really like very natural. Yeah. But it, I really I caught it. It just it's so striking because everyone's like so high stakes, high stakes, high stakes. Hi. Hey. I'm like oh my god. It, yeah. It's just, you really see their relationship really build out, and I think that was a really great moment right there. Yeah. In, yeah. It's you know to what we were talking about before. It doesn't have to be big moments and big things happening because that feels like a bigger moment even yeah. than the, the sil- like it's, it's almost silly. The, the, this big thing that Charlie's trying to do for Howie at that point, yeah. like, yes, it's like, that's the big gesture. It's like they steal a boat and confess his love, but not really <laughs> like, but that's not the big thing that's happening. Right. It's the small things. Yeah, Actually, it's which the I think is small nice. things. Yeah. Anything else about this movie? No, I guess we talked about it all. We've talked about everything. I'm sure there's more. I don't know. I think that's it. <laughs> We've done it. We've done it. We've done it. We've cracked it. We cracked the code. All right. Well, thank you. Everyone, <laughs> for watching and for listening. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I think we're going to be done. Sounds good. Okay, great. I'm Pavi. And I'm Colin. And this is Then a Moment. Thanks. See you again next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Then a Moment, a Pavitas production project, hosted by Colin Funk and Pavi Prochko. This podcast is produced by Chicago Podcast Studio. Our opening cartoon was created by Gloriu, and our theme song was composed by me, Pavi Prochko. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite listening platform. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Then a Moment Pod, all one word, for updates on new episodes and behind the scenes content. If you have any feedback, comments, concerns, or kudos, you can email us at thenamomentpod at gmail.com. Please rate and review us wherever you can. It would help us out a bunch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.